We are taught in our history books that the French Revolution was a step towards democracy, freedom, and human rights. But those who really study history know that history is written by the winners. Today we're going to see what history actually has to reveal about the French Revolution and why understanding it is so important to the end times. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is the Dance of Life podcast, and I'm your host, as always, Tudor Alexander. Thanks so much for joining me today. We're going to get into a very interesting topic today. Now, just a very quick preface for those people who are watching my End Time series. This is obviously an updated episode because I had to change a couple of things. First and foremost, the camera angle when I first recorded this episode back, I guess, I don't know, about a year prior to the current video that I'm recording now with you. Uh, the camera, it accidentally took my webcam from my laptop. So it was just horrible quality. It bothered me forever. And so I finally had time to redo it. Uh, that was my original reason for doing this. But there's also going to be new information. A lot of new information on this particular event, which we call the French Revolution, as well as the art of war and things like that. So this is going to be a fun episode. It's going to be if you've seen, if you saw my original one, it'll be good review, but it also will be full of some new information. Now, really quick, if you haven't seen my end time series, I encourage you to go check it out. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on my website, ad free. Very, very important. Most people are deceived on end times events. They're deceived by Jewish focused futurism, such as dispensationalism, premillennialism, even postmillennialism. All of these preterism, all of these false eschatologies have really made their way quite a bit into the mainstream, especially in the last 200 years. So make sure you are edified. There's a lot to deprogram. And certainly my goal has been to create a library to help you do that. But you have to put in the work. Let's put it that way. You have to put in the work to deprogram because what we grew up with and what our pastors told us and what our churches told us most of it is not true in terms of at least the end times. So very important. I just released, as of the time of this video, a another series, an end times type of series called The Great Delusion. So make sure you go check that out. That actually will wrap up everything. And we're going to touch on topics from that uh, series, The Great Delusion, because it covers really everything. It integrates everything into one reality. So you see how all of these threads, like Zionism, Christian nationalism, the charismatic movement, dispensationalism, you know, the whole state of Israel, the third temple, John Darby, all of these things are really coming to a head into one great delusion. And so make sure you check that series out. A lot of it will be touched on here as well, as far as um, the French Revolution goes and Zionism. So we have a lot of really cool things to do. Really quick summary for those people who are watching my series, just a very quick summary. We've seen in the previous episode, number 13, we talked about the two witnesses, how they're symbolic for the word of God, how they were killed after the 1260 year period. If you're just watching this for the first time and you don't know what I'm talking about, then you know go check out the previous episodes. But after the 1260 year period, they basically resurrect. Now we know that the French Revolution banned the Bible burned Bibles, atheism became supreme, and we'll look at that today as well. But the two witnesses resurrected after that, obviously spiritually through things like the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening to be specific, where there were missionaries, Bible clubs, Bible colleges, all these things that were going out spreading the gospel through the Sixth Church, the Church of Philadelphia. I talk about that in my later in my end time series in the Seven Churches. So there's different phases of the church. And the, the Sixth church, which is Philadelphia or brotherly love, really correlates with this resurrection of the two witnesses very nicely. Remember my end times see, um, timeline, the prophetic timeline that I created as a graphical aid for you to use for this series, or in general for end times events where you have all the prophecies of Daniel and all the prophecies in Revelation all lined up on a nice little timeline with a graphical representation. So you can see how everything lines up nice and neat. Now, Revelation 17 says that there's going to be a final church-state union. And it talks about a beast that comes from the bottomless pit, which is a very important detail because that beast is exactly the beast that kills the two witnesses. And we looked at that. 
And that is an interesting connection, a connection that I think a lot of people don't, they just kind of pass over, or maybe they're not making it, because that means that the beast from the bottomless pit, that the woman who's writing, which of course the woman is the Catholic Church, that final church-state union arose during the French Revolution, because it has to have arisen because it kills the two witnesses. The beast that rises out of the bottomless pit kills the two witnesses. The two witnesses, i.e. the Word of God, were quote-unquote killed by the French Revolution, by atheism, for three and a half years. And that happened in 1798. So there is a correlation between... What's the point? There's a correlation between the French Revolution... And the final iteration of this Babylonian religio-political system that we're heading towards, we're not there yet where the kings of the earth have given their power to Mystery Babylon, but we will be in this, in this generation and understanding how it kind of all began in some sense. Of course, it's been around since the beginning of time, but, but this final phase, we want to understand how did it connect and where did it come from, which is the French Revolution. And the Bible reveals that to you. So that means that we really want to know more about this French Revolution event and what happened. This was an inflection point in history, but not how most people realize, because again, most people think, oh, it's democracy and human rights and all these things, and really it's quite the opposite. Revelation 17 shows this final beast system, which is the union of church and state, and really it's just the final iteration of this Babylonian system. Like in Daniel 2, you have a, a statue, and that statue is one statue, but it has different phases, but it's one system. Do you get it? And of course, Christ returns and destroys this system once and for all. So again, very important to remember that the beast, that the woman rides at the very end, emerges from the bottomless pit and kills the two witnesses. Now, of course, we're not given exact year, so don't be dogmatic about, well, the beast emerged in this year, then they killed the two witnesses. It's not about that. The point is that th these two things intersect, that when the, the two witnesses were killed is also when the beast emerges, because it has to emerge to kill the two witnesses. So what is the point? Well, the point is that we are seeing the culmination of the last 200 years or so, plus or minus, of this beast coming out of the bottomless pit, this final iteration of this system. Well, how do you how did you make sense of that? Well, the French Revolution began basically this dialectic, and we're going to get into more of this as we go on, but the French Revolution began the dialectic between left and right. How did it do that? Well, the French Revolution created atheism, and it mainstreamed atheism, which ultimately led to communism and the left, socialism, communism, the left, and so on. Well, the left doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? The left exists only because there's a right. Do you get it? Now, what is the opposite of communism? Well, the opposite of communism is Christian nationalism. It's what the beast enjoyed for a very long period of time. But in order to make that look good, you have to create the opposite that makes you want to beg for the original, the original counterfeit, really. But either way, it's good cop, bad cop. To get how that works, they're both cops. Ultimately, the bad cop is there to be bad and to beat you up and to make you really want to talk to the good cop. The good cop comes in and looks amazing compared to the bad cop, but they're both cops. Communism was created to push people so far to the left that they will beg for a for a union of church and state again. Now, again, if this sounds like news to you, then watch all my other stuff. Watch my end time series. Watch The Great Delusion. You'll get it there as well. But the point is this. Communism is designed to make Catholicism look good. I have plenty of dark to light episodes in this series, in this end time series. As you continue watching it towards the end, you're going to see episode number 22, I believe, where we talk about how all of this comes together because we talk about the king of the north and the king of the south in Daniel 11, which is this interesting picture of a duality that the Bible shows you. And there's one verse in that entire chapter that really anchors it all home, as far as I'm concerned. 
And that verse is that they eat together at the same table. They, they're both planning mischief, but they do it at the same table. So this duality of one force versus another is really just an illusion. And that's a profound thing that the Bible reveals to you, especially as it has to do with this final stretch from the French Revolution until the capstone of their Illuminati pyramid where everything is united. So very important to understand that this dialectic of the two-party system, communism, nationalism, religion versus atheism, secularism versus you know Christian nationalism, these are just dialectics designed to ultimately ping pong people faster and faster between opposites so that they get to the desired result. The French Revolution was also when the mortal wound happened to the papacy. Now remember the Bible says it seemed to have a mortal wound. So that is also a very important detail, which you will realize why it says that. It's just, it's amazing. I truly hope you walk away today with such an appreciation for, the, for God's word. There is literally no wasted word in the Bible. And it's amazing how each, even one word, like the word seemed, can have such a profound significance that God revealed that specific word to John, that it seemed to have a mortal wound. It didn't have a mortal wound. It seemed like it did. So the French Revolution is very important because it helps us understand how we got here and where we're going. Do you understand? We are in the middle between when the, the beast from the bottomless pit arose and killed the two witnesses. We're actually not in the middle. We're kind of <laughs> towards the end. But the point is we're in between. We're in between the, the beast coming out of the bottomless pit and killing the two witnesses and we're between the final iteration where the kings in Revelation 17 give their power to the woman, that final system that's going to enforce the mark of the beast, and so on and so forth. So we want to understand how do we get here and where are we going, and the French Revolution is a key event to understand. Most people do not, unfortunately, because dispensationalism has destroyed people's brains, and that's why I urge you and encourage you to go watch my recent documentary series, the Great Delusion, share it with your friends, understand how all of these things, all the threads of the beast, are very quickly coming together in a way that is profoundly evil. You know, when John saw Mystery Babylon, it's written in Revelation there, he marveled greatly, that he marveled greatly at this power. And I realized that after really compiling everything in that series, The Great Delusion, I marvel greatly at how evil this power is and how they are that how they're coordinating everything. It's truly profound. Of course, you know that the Bible tells you that Satan has given this his power to the Catholic Church and the Catholic system as his chosen vehicle to bring all of this together. There are many satanic vehicles out there, folks. The Catholic Church is not the only one. However, the Bible in its infinite wisdom has revealed to you where to pay attention to, the head of the snake. The devil has given his power, Revelation 13, 2, to the beast, meaning the papacy, the papal institution, the Catholic system. This is his choice as to how to wrap things up at the end of time. And if you know that, then you know that the destination is the woman riding the beast, i.e. a union of church and state, just like as it was for 1,400 years, yada, yada, yada. So, very important to understand your history. Now, in this episode, we're going to look specifically at the French Revolution and what really happened, as well as why. There's a lot of very interesting things about the French Revolution that are very little known, especially about Napoleon, which will be really fun. We'll also see what the purpose was behind fomenting this revolution, who was behind it. We're also going to look at the art of war and how this book is not what it seems to be, and how it relates to everything else, especially this final iteration coming back through Revelation 17. It sounds like all these things aren't really related, especially the art of war, but as I hope that you will soon learn, they are very much related. And if you understand the art of war, also the French Revolution, you have a blueprint for practically the last 250 years of history. Do you understand how important this is? If you understand these two things, and you will by the end of this episode, if you give it focus and attention, 
That's my promise to you is that you will have a blueprint and a basic understanding of everything that's happened ever since then. And you'll understand why I say that. Now, before we get right into it, make sure you subscribe, you hit that like button, you comment, leave a comment of your thoughts. If you do all three, your discernment will grow by a whopping 58%. So that's a pretty big return on your investment. Make sure you do so. Now, if you want to support me, all jokes aside, you can be a member on my website. That is the only way to really support me. You get There's a donate button there as well if you want. But if you want to support me, I don't sell gimmicky products and I never plan on doing so. I don't sell gold or Roth IRAs or whatever else these people are selling these days, health potions and lotions. I don't ever plan on doing any of that. I hope that I never have to do that. However, I do have a membership program on my website. You can have over $1,200 worth of exclusive content for members. You can access old content, do research and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to support me, it's five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year. And you can do so at danceoflife.com. Thanks so much for that. Now let's get into it. So the art of war is the first thing that I want to start with because the art of war really sets the stage for everything else. Now, you may be wondering, how the heck does the art of war tie into this? The art of war was written by some Chinese general, like in 500 BC or whatever. Well, not so fast. It's not what you think it is. And hopefully you'll see that today. Understanding the art of war as a Jesuit manual of operations is the key for understanding practically everything that's happened in the last 200 years. 50 years or whatever. I've talked a lot about Protestant infiltrations, secret societies, for example, Billy Graham, uh, Norman Vincent Peale. There's so many Protestants, uh, Jerry Falwell. All these people are secret society members that on the surface are Protestant, but they're actually secret society agents. And again, when the Bible tells you that the beast seemed like it received a mortal wound, what really happened is it went underground and it created a shadow government, which has been ruling ever since then. The beast was ruling out in the open, didn't need shadow government. Once the mortal wound happened, you had a shift and the beast created a shadow government with the Jesuits and secret societies and various orders and so on. And that's how it infiltrated Protestantism, and you'll see it all come together very nicely. But you have to understand, what is the basis for that? Well, they revealed it to you through the art of war. The art of war will make you realize just how real all this stuff really is. Now, it supposedly was written in, like I said, sometime between 475 to 221 BC, so some point in time in the BCs. However, there are many reasons to be skeptical of this. If you've looked into Shakespeare and the Jesuits, which we have, look at my um, Jesuit, Holly episode, Jesuit Hollywood episode in this end time series. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The Jesuits owned all the theaters in Europe and were using the theaters as a way to shape culture, learning against learning as a product of the Counter-Reformation. You got to remember an important piece of context as we go into this. The Reformation happened in the 1500s. That was a real thorn in the side of the papacy because people started to identify the beast system. And the printing press came out. You had a lot of decentralization. You, you can't control grassroots movements. It was lighting a fire through Europe. Even some Catholics were starting to question. So the strategy had to change from iron fist to, well, now let's let's infiltrate people. Let's, let's create counter narratives. Let's destroy ideologies. It became an information war in the Counter-Reformation. This is a very important thing to realize, that the beast strategy has changed. And part of that strategy was creating these various culturally influencing paradigms. Like Hollywood today is really a product. In fact, there's a whole, we talk about it in the Jesuit Hollywood episode, but Catholics started Hollywood. That's a, that was a Jesuit operation. Of course, it liberalized and the Jesuits put the Jews up and let them, you know, do their dirty work. And as you'll soon see here, and in my episode on the Great Delusion, the Jews have always been propped up by the Jesuits as a front man to do their dirty work. But nonetheless, Hollywood was practiced for, you know, 200 years before it was created through the theaters in Europe. 
And you'll see, just like with communism and the French Revolution, communism was practiced for 150 years before it was started. So all of these things, if you understand that Shakespeare and the Jesuits and Shakespeare was very likely not even a real person. He was just a, a fictitious person and the people who wrote his plays were just Jesuits. So there's a lot to be studied there. If you've looked into, for example, book fabrication and art fabrication in the Renaissance period, the Vatican is very you know, well known for all its forgeries. There were so many forgeries for art, for various old books, because there was a big money-making business during that period of time with the Renaissance. There's a lot of people who have documented these things that there's just so many forgeries that came out of the Renaissance. For example, the Shroud of Turin, that's another famous forgery. They claim that, oh, this is Jesus' spirit cloth, when actually it was probably made, you know, sometime during the Renaissance. So what's the point? The point is that history is a lie. I'm not saying everything is a lie, and you should be like, you know, what year is that? Are we in the year 1000? Actually, not, not that extreme. But history is written by the winners, folks. So you have to do a lot of digging to understand that when you see something like the art of war, which we're going to go through it in very great detail, and you realize other things that I just shared with you, like Shakespeare, the Counter-Reformation, controlling theaters, forgeries by the Vatican. Another thing is that the Jesuits were banned in 1773. We're going to look at that next. And right before that, you see the art of war being translated into French by a Jesuit to reveal what they're going to do. So very too many things are intersecting to make me believe that this art of war was supposedly written by some Chinese general hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. When in reality, as you read it, you'll see it's actually about the Jesuit general and the Pope and the duality that goes on with the beast. So that's something to consider. Now, important historical context is that the Jesuits were banned. So let's read a little bit about that. And this is from Wikipedia. Look, I mean, these are, this is going to be, you know, soft stuff, but they give you enough to understand. And you can look into this on your own if you want more information. But the suppression of the Society of Jesus was removed, was the removal of all the members of the Jesuits from the most of the Western Europe and their respective colonies beginning in 1759, along with the abolition of the order by the Holy See in 1773. The papacy acceded to, to said anti-Jesuit demands without much resistance. The Jesuits were serially expelled from the Portuguese Empire, France, the Two Sicilies, Malta, Parma, the Spanish Empire, and Austria and Hungary. Now, why do you think that was the case? That's an important question to ask. Historians identify multiple factors causing the suppression. The Jesuits who were not above getting involved in politics, now this is a very watered down statement, were, dis were distrusted for their closeness to the Pope and his power in independent nations, religious and political affairs. In France, it was a combination of many influences from Jansenism to free thought to the, to the then prevailing impatience with the ancient regime. Monarchies attempting to centralize and secularize political power viewed the Jesuits as supranational, meaning above nations, too strongly allied to the papacy and too autonomous from the monarchs in whose territory they operated. With his papal brief Dominus Ac Redemptor, Pope Clement XIV suppressed the society as fight accompli. However, the order did not disappear. Also a very watered down statement but they tell you the truth. It continued underground operations in China, Russia, Prussia, the United States. In Russia, Catherine the Great allowed the founding of a new novitiate. In 1814, a subsequent pope, Pope Pius VII, acted to restore the Society of Jesus to its previous provinces, and the Jesuits began to resume their work in those countries. Oh, yes, they did resume, and you'll see exactly how they resumed that work. So, how do we put this together? Well, let's go over a little bit of history to understand how we got to 1773. The Jesuits were founded in 1534. In about 250 years, they grew incredibly powerful. The question is how? Well, one of the ways was through the Jesuit reductions in South America, which I mentioned previously. And we're going to 
read about these. Actually, oh, here we go. This is Pope Clement. I forgot to read about him, but he is the one who basically uh, abolished the Jesuit order. But let's read about him really quick because there's something important you should know. Also watered down. The last months of Clement XIV's life were embittered by his failures, and he seemed always to be in sorrow because of this. His work was hardly accomplished before Clement XIV, whose usual constitution was quite vigorous, fell into a languishing sickness, generally attributed to poison. No conclusive evidence. Here comes the, you know, whitewashing. No conclusive evidence of poisoning was ever produced. The claims that the Pope was poisoned were denied by those closest to him. And the and as the annual register for 1774 stated, he was over 70 and had been in, hell, in ill health for quite some time. So if you believe that, then I have some beachfront property in Phoenix to sell you that's selling really hot right now. But nevertheless, what happened was the Jesuits poisoned him for basically abolishing the order. Why do you think Pope Pius VII said, all right, we can play ball. We don't need to be, you know, getting poisoned and, and having all this nonsense going on. So Pope Clement was poisoned by the Jesuits for taking taking them off the register. Now, this is the thing I wanted to read you to, which is the, uh, the reductions in Paraguay. How did the Jesuits become so wealthy? Well, here's how they became wealthy. And I have a whole episode plan on this in the future, but little bit here. Reductions, also called reducciones or congregaciones, reducao, were settlements established by Spanish rulers and Roman Catholic missionaries in Spanish America and the Spanish East Indies, i.e. the Philippines. In Portuguese-speaking Latin America, such reductions were also called aldeas. The Spanish and Portuguese relocated forcibly in many cases. And again, this is Wikipedia, so remember that this is very tame indigenous inhabitants of their colonies into urban settlements and modeled those in Spain and Portugal. The Royal Academy of Spain defines reducción as a grouping into a settlement of indigenous people for the purpose of evangelization and assimilation. Again, if you believe that, I have some beachfront property in Phoenix to sell you. That is really beautiful. In colonial Mexico, reductions were called congregations four settlements aimed to congregate indigenous people into co communities, facilitating civil and religious control over populations. The concentration of the indigenous peoples into towns facilitated the organization explo and exploitation of their labor. Yes, it did. These people worked 12 hours a day, brought in all of their produce to the Jesuits. The Jesuits would choose how to divide it evenly about everybody. I mean, it was communism to the most extreme that you can imagine. But it was it was Catholic communism, which is interesting. The practice began during Spanish colonization in the Caribbean, re relocating populations to be closer to Spanish settlements, often at a distance from their home territories and likely facilitated the spread of disease. Reductions could be either religious, established and administered by an order of the Roman Catholic Church, especially the Jesuits, or secular under the control of Spanish or Portuguese government authorities, the best known and most successful of the religious reductions were those developed by the Jesuits in Paraguay and their neighboring areas in the 17th century. Oh yeah, they got pretty much all of Latin America to be communist back in the 16th, 1700s. The largest and most enduring secular reductions were those imposed on the highland people of the former Inca Empire of Peru during the rule of Viceroy Francisco de Toledo. So again, this stuff is very watered down, but I want to just touch on it because... There's a whole can of worms here. There really is, folks. And like I said, I have a whole um, episode that I have planned on covering a lot deeper stuff from different books because Wikipedia is not going to give you, obviously, the full truth. But here's something to understand. You had the Spanish Armada that basically conquered all of Latin America for Spain, which really was Catholic Spain. Now, the Jesuits used this military power infiltrated South America, implemented this communist system through these reductions, where again, these people had no rights. They worshiped the Jesuits as gods. They gave them all the fruit of their land. The Jesuits basically took it and, you know, sold it and made millions and millions of pounds of gold from, from what they were doing. And so basically over the course of these reductions, over the 150 years or whatever else of enslaving who knows how many millions of people 
they became exceedingly wealthy. They became very, very wealthy. They plundered and pillaged these people and, you know, left them nothing, basically. So over time, they used that power and influence to foment many subversions and revolutions in Europe. Now, one example, again, we're just touching on things so that you understand the, the sequence, is the gunpowder plot. The gunpowder plot, this is Wikipedia, of 1605 in earlier centuries, often called the gunpowder treason plot or the Jesuit treason, was an unsuccessful attempt, attempted regicide or killing against the King James by a group of English Catholics led by Robert Catesby who considered their actions attempted tyrannicide and who sought regime change in England after decades of religious persecution. Now England and England had a history of back and forth with the beast. And if you understand that, then you also understand how dispensationalism came about. But moving on, watch The Great Delusion, you'll learn. The plan was to blow up the House of Lords during the state opening of Parliament on 5th November 1605, as the prelude to a popular revolt in the Midlands during which King James' nine-year-old daughter, Princess Elizabeth, was to be installed as the new head of state. So, very evil plot to destroy and basically wipe out all of England's rulership. It failed, and of course, today people celebrate Guy Fawkes Day with that stupid anonymous mask, but you need to realize that that is celebrating a Jesuit operative. And this whole, you know, white hats are in control and anonymous and whatever else, I mean, these things are just Jesuit distractions. But what's the point? Well, by 1773, the, the monarchies had experienced a lot of subversions from the Jesuits. And they knew, remember that article, the first one we read with the suppression, oh, the Jesuits got involved in politics. Yeah, that's an understatement. They were subverting people who weren't going along with their business constantly doing political intrigues and they had the money to do it. And so by 1773, the monarchies had started to flex their muscles and say, you know what, we're not gonna deal with you anymore, Pope. We're gonna do our own thing. They're, they started to ban the Jesuits. They started to basically flex their muscles. Because again, the Bible tells you that the Antichrist power on the earth, he rules without armies of his own in Daniel. That's the little horn. So this power, this religio-political power, has manipulated people into basically obeying without having a standing army, which is profound. And, and the monarchs in the 1700s started to realize it. Like, wait a minute, why are we... If we just band together, like why are, why are we bowing down to the Pope? And so this started to create a real problem for the beast and of course for the Jesuits too because their influence was cut off, their money lines were cut off, and the Jesuits now needed to push a cataclysm to invert the order here. The monarchies were, the monarchies were a real thorn in the side for the beast. And for, again, for two main reasons. The first one was the rebellion of the monarchs and flexing their power and basically taking control back and not being completely subservient. And another important reason is that monarchy as a system is politically stagnant. Monarchy as a system is not dualistic. It's one person, mon, one, arc, archon, ruler, one ruler. So what's the problem? Well, a monarchy, a monarch is there for like, you know, 40, 50 years, and it's just one person. But if you could have duality and you can control both sides, then things can move a lot faster. Do you get the point? Monarchy was just an out, it was, it was coming to its end. It needed to be destroyed, and we need to get to this new system so that eventually people can come back to the beast because things were changing. Again, you had the, the counter-reformation. I'm sorry, you had the reformation, which was a thorn in the side of the beast. You had the Ottoman Empire too, by the way, which is hammering the beast from the other side while the Protestants were leaving to the United States. You had the European monarchs rebelling against the beast and saying, you know what, get out of here, Jesuits, we're not dealing with you anymore. So you had like fronts everywhere, fires the beast had to put out. And so a, a reset was in order, basically. A reset was in order and a reset that would reset the governments that would create the foundation politically to infiltrate Protestantism, bring people back to the beast by giving them the illusion of voting and choice and 
politics and all this stuff. You had to, you just had a new thing that needed to be ha- happening. And that new thing demanded that there was this French Revolution, which is a fascinating event. Now, because the Pope went along with the monarchs, the, the first Pope, Pope Clement the Fourteenth, I believe, they gave him a message. He was arrested and he was poisoned. So by the time the Jesuits were reinstated in 1814, a couple decades later, the Pope was very much like in alignment with the Jesuits. So today you're going to learn some very important things that happened in that gap of time between 1773, when the Jesuits were banned, and 1814, when they were reinstated. But first, we have to look at the art of war. So now that you have all this historical context leading up to 1773, when the Jesuits were banned, you have to realize that the first copy of the art of war that was ever translated was translated by a French Jesuit named Jean-Joseph-Marie Amiot. He was a French astronomer for the emperor of China at the time. And he released this book one year before the Jesuits were banned, and six years before the French Revolution was fomented. So that's an interesting detail that adds to the previous ones that makes this Art of War book seem... I'm very skeptical that it was written by an actual Chinese general in you know 300 BC or whatever. But here's an important book that is something you should check out. This is The Jesuits, The Society of Jesus and the Betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church, by Malachi Martin. Now, on page, let's see if I can find it, I believe, 490. It's somewhere over here. Yeah, it's on page 490. We want to read something very important about how things are done. Starting here, right at the top of the page. Whether by intent or not, Segundos is the ultimate answer of Father General Colvin Batch and his Jesuits to the continued... Co- continued and continual dissatisfaction of the popes with the new society. Now, he's talking about a person that wrote a book, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but it's an important detail here. That the Jesuit general and his Roman staff sanction such a book makes it, in essence, their answer to John Paul and to anyone else who would alter the course of the Jesuit order, as set during the two decades since GC 31 and the emergence of Pedro Arupe. So there's a scandal going on in the Catholic Church, that this is documenting. And the book in question is Theology and the Church, 1986, A Response to Cardinal Ratzinger and a Warning to the Church by Juan Luis Segundo. So that book is quoted, it's written by a Jesuit, and it's quoted in this book. Now, what's the operative statement that we want? It's the second sentence. That the Jesuit general and his Roman staff sanction such a book what does that mean? That means that there is no book that any Jesuit will ever publish, whether it's a translation or an actual, you know, thing that they created, that is not sanctioned by the Jesuit general. Because again, the Jesuits, if you know about their oath of obedience and strict militaristic order, nothing that you do as as being under the general just passes willy-nilly. You have to have the approval of the Jesuit general. Why is that significant? Well, that means that the person, Jean-Marie, who translated the art of war into French, mind you, which is the language that, of the place that where the French Revolution happened, that was sanctioned by the Jesuit general. So again, one more detail that just points you to the truth that this is not what you think it is. No Jesuit who writes anything can do so without the approval of the Jesuit general. Now, there's an occult practice that hopefully you're familiar with, which is that they reveal to you things in plain sight. They reveal to you things before they do them so that through your subtle acceptance, they have the blessing to do it. See the point? This is done throughout time. And of course, a lot of people today see like predictive programming and various shows with events that happened, you know, in the future. Of course, this is a practice that the occults, the occult people do to reveal something to you before they do it. So again, another reason why this book is not what you think it is. Now, for the fun part. 
course, this is all fun, but we're going to go through the Art of War and just take some samplings of it and see where, or I should say, what spirit was really guiding this book. Because I don't think for one minute that the author was some Chinese general uh, in 300 BC. Anyway, so this is, let's see, chapter, what chapter is this? Chapter one, laying plans. These are just selected verses. Verse 18, all warfare is based on deception. Right away you should have a fennec fox moment because God does not need to use deception. God has said, I have said nothing in secret. Who needs to use deception? It's the father of lies that needs to use deception. So, right away. Verse 19. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe that we are far away. When we are far away, we must make him believe we are near. Seemed like it had a mortal wound. Now, the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple ere the battle is fought. Now, this is an important statement for one single word here, which is temple. A temple is where you have sacrifices. Of course, if you know the Catholic teaching on the Mass and transubstantiation, the Mass is a sacrifice, meaning the church that you go to is actually a temple. So, there's that, which is very interesting. Chapter number two, waging war. Let's see, what do we got here? Verse 15, hence a wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to 20 of one's own. And likewise, a single pickle of his provender is equivalent to 20 from one's own store. So pillage on the enemy, make sure you use their stuff, kind of like how the Jesuits did with the Spaniards, and use their army to pillage the natives of South America. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when ten or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy. And the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kind of, kindly treated and kept. Keep this in mind because it's going to make sense when we talk about Napoleon. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's strength. So use them, turn them into spies. This is chapter 3, I believe. Yeah, chapter 3 and verse 11. Now, the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the bulwark is defective, the state will be weak. Does this sound like communism to you? It should, because the Jesuits are the ones who authored it. Chapter 4, Tactical Dispositions. Sun Tzu said the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. That's right. The Protestants today are walking back into the Mother Church gladly, which should tell you that we're very close to the end. Verse 12, hence his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. Do you know anything about the Jesuit general? You can look him up, you can look up his name, but you're not going to know anything about what he does. His victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. Out in the open is not how things are done. They're done from the shadows, which again tells you what spirit was writing this. Chapter 5, Energy. Sun Tzu said, the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up their numbers. Spoken like a true communist. Uh, let's see. Chapter 6. Weak points and strong. Verse 1. Whoever is first in the field and waits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle will arrive exhausted. Now, there's an interesting verse that comes to my mind. Maybe there's a correlation, but when God is chastising Cain and telling him that sin is crouching at the door and waiting to basically, you know, pounce on you, sin is already there. It's already in the field. Remember, Satan is the most clever of any of the beasts of the field. Then later, after the sacrifices were offered between Abel and Cain, and Cain is very, you know, upset and jealous, 
God tells him, listen, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Sin is crouching at the door and it wants to rule over you. It's crouching there in the field waiting for you. And of course, how did Cain kill Abel? He killed him in the field. He crouched and waited. Probably before Abel came, he got there first and he killed Abel. So all of this is incredibly satanic is the point. Verse 9, O divine art of subtlety and secrecy, through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible. Divine art of subtlety and secrecy. Does that sound like anything God would say? Of course, the answer is no, because God doesn't need to be subtle and secret. It's the devil that is the most subtle of every creature that God has made. Chapter 7, Maneuvering. Sun Tzu said, in war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign. Now, there are two people highlighted in this story of the art of war. One of them is the general. One of them is the sovereign. Can you guess who the sovereign is? Well, if you guess the pope, then you're right, because that's who he is. Verse 19, let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night. And when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. So be shrouded in darkness, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. Does that remind you of any verses from the Bible? Maybe perhaps when Jesus sends the 70 and they return, and he says, I I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and how the thunderbolt is associated to Satan, especially these days with all the rock stars and all of the occult that they deal in. Thunder and lightning, he's the prince of the power of the air. Chapter... Eight, variation of tactics. Verse one, Sun Tzu said, in war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign, collects his army, and concentrates his forces. Of course, you know the Jesuits are a military military organization, and they're supposed to be under the Pope, but they kind of, you'll see, kind of have the mind of their own. Verse three, there are roads which must not be followed, armies which must not be attacked, towns which must not be besieged, positions which must not be contested, Commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. Do you understand? They're submitting to the sovereign, but not un, not if it doesn't work with the agenda. So this is a very interesting revelation to you, that there's kind of two heads to the snake. Chapter 9, the army on the march. Let's see if there's anything in here. Some of these, you know, there's so much in here. And again, this is just such an Antichrist book. I don't recommend necessarily reading it, but... Verse 42 and 43, if soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you, they will not prove submissive, and unless submissive, they will be practically useless. Therefore, soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity, but kept under control by means of iron discipline. So, manipulation, gaslighting, emotional tricks, sound like anybody to you? Chapter 10, terrain. Let's see. Verse 23. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbids it. Who is the ruler? The sovereign, i.e. the pope. If fighting will not result in victory, then you must not fight even at the ruler's bidding. So again, there is a theme of submission to the sovereign, but only if it's appropriate, which is an interesting situation. Chapter 11, The Nine Situations. Let's see. Okay. It is the business, this is verse 35 and 36. It is the business of a general to be quiet and thus ensure secrecy. Upright and just and thus maintain order. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances and thus keep them in total ignorance. Do you have an understanding now of the blueprint for all these secret societies? How they all base themselves on constant illusions. Every Unless you're like the top of the top, you don't have the full truth and you're kept in, in deception. And they're deceiving each other all the time and they're warring with each other. It's just a total mess. But that's because the father of lies is their master. Verse 60. Success in warfare is gained by carefully accommodating ourselves to the enemy's purpose. That's a very important one for the Counter-Reformation. Chapter 13, the attack by fire. Let's see what this one's about. Actually, nothing. Chapter 13, the use of spies. 
Oh, this one's a good one. A lot to read in this one. Verse 7 and 8. Hence the use of spies of whom there are five classes. Listen up. Local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, and surviving spies. When these five kinds of spy are all at work, none can discover the secret system, i.e. the shadow government. This is called the divine manipulation of the threads. It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. So the faculty of the sovereign, which is the Pope, is to have the divine manipulation of all of these various threads. That's why I said you can't get lost in secret societies and, you know, just getting in the weeds of all these things. The Bible identifies to you who you need to pay attention to. You do not need to be a history buff, a history expert. You don't need to be a Bible expert. It tells you, Revelation 13 too, the dragon, Satan, gave his power to the beast. What's the beast? The Roman papacy. So that is the chosen vehicle by which all the other little snakes swarm around. You get it? Verse 9, having local spies means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district. These are the different kinds of spies now. Having inward spies is making use of officials of the enemy. Does that sound like people to you? Maybe like Billy Graham, Norman Vincent Peale, who are 33rd degree Freemasons? Having converted spies is getting hold of the enemy's spies and using them for our own purposes. Having doomed spies, doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our own spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. Surviving spies finally are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp. Hence, it is with none in the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with the spies. The spies are the most important, you know, gems and assets of the snake because they serve to propagate the counter-reformation. Can't control with an iron fist anymore. You have to control with subversion and deception because the game has changed since the Reformation. Verse 21 and the last one that we'll read. The enemy spies who have come to spy on us must be sought out, tempted with bribes, led away and comfortably housed. Thus they will become converted spies and available for our service. Now, if you understand everything that I've read to you, and of course there's probably so much more to read in that stupid book, but I don't recommend it. It is an antichrist book. It is an antichrist book by every definition of the word. But if you understand these things, then you see where I am going. So important to understand the art of war as a foundation philosophically and spiritually for what they are doing. The first translation was by a Jesuit, one year before the Jesuits were banned, quote unquote, and six years before the French Revolution, which is what they started. The Jesuit general approved of this book because of the oath, oath of obedience. Books, the book is probably talking about the Jesuit general and the Pope, very likely. The general and the sovereign, you know, it's very obvious. And Sun Tzu, very likely, but I'm going to let you decide, is a fictitious character. The Bible says that the beast appeared to have a mortal wound. This is 100% in line with the art of war. We know also that the Reformation happened and there was a need to create a different strategy, i.e. through spies, through espionage, through infiltration, through deception, all kinds of these shadow, shadow government type of activities. We know that the dialectic of liberalism and conservatism, left versus right, was created by the French Revolution. The Jesuits, as you'll soon learn, also started the Illuminati, communism, liberalism, the Rothschilds fit into this. Napoleon and dispensationalism fit into this. So this is a very important inflection point for history. Now, what is the goal? Well, the Bible tells you in Revelation 17, the kings of the earth will give their power to the woman riding the beast. That is the final goal. That is where all of this is headed, and we're very close. Remember the art of war. The general's goal is to bring people back to the sovereign. The sovereign's chief responsibility is the divine manipulation of the threads, all these different threads. That's why I said go watch my Great Delusion documentary series. 
You can see how all the threads are uniting, and they truly are in a fantastic way. But the Bible says, don't swerve to the right or to the left over 16 times. Tells you to walk the narrow road to see beyond the dialectical scheme, because this is how the devil gets you. If he can't get you with atheism, he's going to get you with Christian nationalism. One or the other is going to happen, and so you have to always walk the narrow road, and that requires discernment. It requires learning and focusing your mind, meditating, not meditating, you know, like Eastern mysticism, but meditating on things, thinking, reflecting, studying history, understanding how you got here. Because we're at the end, folks. The art of war is, has been, been played out for the last 250 years. Imagine how much deception and unlearning you have to do and account for. So this is our context now for the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution started officially in 1789, and it lasted for 10 years until 1799. The monarchs were ruling up until that point in time. So you had basically a system of monarchy up and uh, up most of the earth's history was a monarchical system. The French Revolution changed that, which is profound. The system that we have today of this whole two-party dialectical system, that was created at the French Revolution. But but both sides are controlled and this is the thing to realize. And why is that the case? Well, first off, to give you the illusion of participation and to make things go faster. You need duality so that you can have an opposite, then that pushes you this way, then this one pushes you back that way, this one, king of the north, king of the south. They're both fighting against each other, it seems like, but really they're working their plans at the same table, is what the Bible tells you. So a few interesting things about the French Revolution. Let's take a look. This is from the book titled The History of Europe from the Commencement of the French Revolution, Volume 2 by Archibald Allison. Now we're going to read, what are we going to read here? Okay, lost my place. These things are tough because you can't really highlight them, but this is again, History of Europe. We're going to read a little bit about it. Herbert Chaumet and their associates appeared at the bar and declared, quote, God does not exist, and that the worship of reason was to be substituted in his stead. A veiled female, arrayed in blue drapery, was brought into the assembly, and Chaumet, taking her by the hand, says, Mortals, cease to tremble before the powerless thunders of a god whom, you, whom your fears have created. Henceforth acknowledge no divinity but reason. I offer you its noblest and purest image, if you must have idols sacrificed only to such as this. When letting fall the veil, he exclaimed, Fall before the august senate of freedom, O veil of reason. At the same time, the goddess appeared personified by a celebrate, celebrated beauty, the wife of Mamoro, a printer known in more than one character to most of the convention. The goddess, after being embraced by the president, was mounted on a significant on a magnificent car and conducted amidst an immense crowd to the Cathedral of Notre Dame to take the place of the deity. There she was elevated to the high altar and received the adoration of all the present, while the young women, her attendants, whose alluring looks already sufficiently indicated their profession, i.e. they were prostitutes, uh, retired into the chapels around the choir where every species of licentious, licentiousness and obscenity was indulged in without control, without hardly any veil from the public gaze. To such a length was this carried that Robespierre afterwards declared that Chalmette deserved death for the abominations he had permitted on the occasion. Thenceforth, that ancient edifice was called the Temple of Reason. So, just a little context, we're going to read a couple things about the French Revolution, but I want you to realize all of its occult and blasphemous origins. Now, this is the Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen, which was published uh, by the French Revolution, set by France's National Constituent Assembly in 1789, is a human civil rights document. Ah, oh, civil rights. From the French Revolution, inspired by the Enlightenment philosophers, which, by the way, were all Luciferians, like Helena Blavatsky, the Declaration was a core statement of the values of the French Revolution, and it had a significant impact on the development of popular conceptions of individual liberty and democracy in Europe and worldwide. 
all of the libertarian free will and humanist philosophy that it now infiltrates the church, and it has infiltrated it for quite a while, and people argue against things like election and predestination because they have been duped by these Luciferian values. This is where it comes from, folks. Of course, the actual, it's as old as time, the, the, God, the lie from the Garden of Eden is that you can be like God. But this is its most, you know, recent iteration in the modern age. But I want to show you this picture. I wonder if we can zoom in. Yes, we can. No, we can't. Stupid Google. So annoying. Anyway, if you can look at this picture. Actually, I can zoom in. Let's see. Let's see if I can zoom in. Yes, I can. Okay, so you can see who's our friend here. The one-eyed pyramid with the solar rays, which of course stands for Lucifer. Now there's other things here too. I believe there's an Ouroboros. If you know what that is, a snake eating its own tail. The Phrygian cap, which we're going to look at. This is a Roman fasci. Now a fasci is a Roman thing. Why would they use a Roman symbol of power, which we're going to look at as well. Now you also have the two tablets, which of course is a mockery of the Ten Commandments of God. You have some angel that's, you know, pointing you to the light and releasing your chains and giving you freedom. Do you see how antichrist all of this is? Deliberately antichrist. This is what the French Revolution represents. Very, very important. Notice all of these occult symbols. Now, let's see. This is another one. This is from the history of Marianne's cap. This is from Aramis obspm.france. Very interesting little website about the cap, and we'll take a look at it. Marianne is one of the symbols of the French Republic and embodies the Republic as much as the tricolored flag. Marianne represents the permanence of those values which bind French citizen, citizens to the Republic. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Liberté, equality, fraternité. A Marianne is a bust of a woman wearing a Phrygian cap. In this article, we will be interested in the origins of this bonnet. The cap was worn for the first time in France at the Procope, a coffee shop where revolutionaries used to gather. It resembles the cap worn by freed slaves in the Roman Empire, another Roman theme. Slaves whose masters had, had endowed them with freedom and whose descendants became fully-fledged Roman citizens. Gosh, what a wonderful thing to be a Roman citizen. The Phrygian, the Phrygian cap was thus a symbol of freedom as early as antiquity already. The oldest traces of this bonnet date back to Mithra. There he is. The Iranian divinity of the sun, of friendship, oath, and contracts. Mithraism was the most widespread religion in Europe before Christianity. The statues of Mithra, which have survived to the present day, represent Mithra wearing a Phrygian cap and floating cape. He is kneeling on the primordial bull, holding a dagger in the right hand and drawing the bull's head towards the back with the left. There's their god, the sun god, which of course, if you know, is just another representation of Lucifer. During the French Revolution, the Phrygian caps appeared on the heads of the French a few months after storming the Bastille. They were made of red cloth and matched the striped dresses of fervent revolutionaries, the sans culottes. It seems that an almost identical bonnet capped the sailors and the galley slaves of the Mediterranean. And it's possible that the French revolutionaries coming from the southern France brought it to Paris. To wear the Phrygian cap was indeed a way of advertising one's patriotism. Keep that in mind, too. This bonnet was also one of the outstanding features of the June 20, 1792, a historical day which saw the people invading the Tuileries. The infuriated crowd managed to reach the king himself, and a municipal officer named Mouchet handed a Phrygian cap placed at the end of a spade to the monarch. The king, who was bewildered, was at a loss as to how to react. He seized the bonnet and set it on his head. The gesture somewhat alleviated the attacker's aggressiveness. There was a clear return to the Phrygian cap in its traditional form, with a bent point in France around 1790. Under the influence of the Jacobins, there's our next highlight, the red bonnet came to epitomize the revolution. The American revolutionaries also borrowed the bonnet of freedom from the French, but only a score of years after the Declaration of Independence. Very interesting. This is a picture of the 
um, franc with the red bonnet on it, and this is a Roman coin with Mithra on it. So you can see where these things come from. Nothing new under the sun. This is a picture of Marianne, which is, again, the, the goddess of reason, this whole false deity that they raised up for themselves. Bust of Marianne, you know, wearing her little Mithra sun cap, which, again, feminine, divine feminine. Keep that in mind. It's all part of the same thing. Now, let's look at the secret symbol of the Lincoln Memorial, which all of this ties together, folks. If you know this picture, that he's sitting on a chair, but there's something more to this that you need to understand. Because right here on the sides of Lincoln's chair is are, I should say, Roman fasci. Roman fasci is that thing we saw in the middle of the Declaration of Rights of Man of Every Citizen. It's a bundle of rods. It's a Roman symbol of authority and power. Let's read. While distracted by myths about faces and hair and letter-signing hands, many, many visitors miss the true meaning of the memorial and the ubiquitous symbol that carries that meaning. Instead of being hidden somewhere inaccessible, the symbol is deceptively obvious. Right there under Abraham Lincoln's hands, it's right in your face. This symbol is so overlooked that even when pointed out, many observers will not recognize it. The symbol that is, is that of the fasces, a bundle of rods bounded by a leather thong. Repeated through the memorial, the fasces reveal the higher meaning of Lincoln Memorial and the way the memorial's designers meant to honor Abraham Lincoln. You're going to chuckle at that when you learn why that's the way it is, why it's so ironic. And actually, it's not ironic. It's really evil. What do fasces represent? In ancient times, fasces were a Roman symbol of power and authority, a bundle of wooden rods and an axe bound together by leather thongs. Fasces represented that a man held imperium or executive authority. Who is that man, I wonder? Exercising imperium, a Roman leader could expect his orders to be obeyed, could dole out punishment, and could even execute those who disobeyed. The fasces he carried symbolized this power in two ways. The rods suggested punishment by beating. The axe suggests beheading. On its surface, the fasces implied power, strength, authority, and justice. Of course, justice under their system. So there's a ton of this stuff that you can see. Kind of these little, they're made out. It's hard to tell if you don't know your history, but they're right here on the open under, under his hands, right on the sides of the chair of the, of the Lincoln Memorial. So why is this important? Well, it's actually very important. Actually, we're going to read, let's see, what is this? Uh, yeah, Mithraism. I want to read this too because I forgot to read this. And we'll put it all together, promise. Mithraism is also known as Mithraic Mysteries or the cult, Mistra, or the cult of Mithras was a Roman mystery religion centered on the god Mithras. Although inspired by the Iranian worship of the Zoroastrian divinity, the Roman Mithras was linked to a new and distinctive imagery in the level of Continuity between Persian and Greco-Roman practice remains debatable. The mysteries were popular among the Imperial Roman army from the 1st to the 4th century CE, parallel with Christianity. Of course, Christianity, i.e. Catholicism, integrated all these things, but nonetheless, worshippers of Mithras had a complex system of seven grades of initiation and a communal ritual meal. Initiates called themselves syndexioi, those united by the handshake. Isn't history just fascinating? They met in dedicated Mithra underground temples that survive in large numbers. The cult appears to have had its center in Rome and was popular throughout the western half of the empire as far south as Roman Africa and Numidia and as far east as Roman Dacia, which actually is Romania, where I'm from, as far north as Roman Britain and to a lesser extent in Roman Syria East. So why did I read this to you so that we can put this all together? Well, the Jacobin hat, which you'll learn a little bit more about the Jacobins in a second, they used something that, that is very specifically tied to sun worship. You saw the, the rights of man and every citizen with the Roman fasci, tells you what power is behind it. You saw the occult symbolism, the one-eyed pyramid with the, you know, rays of light, with the Ouroboros eating its own tail, the Jacobin hat tying it to sun worship, 
the Roman fasci tied to, you know, the Roman power. All of these things are related. There is nothing new under the sun. This is just the final iteration of the mystery religion of the ages. Those united by the handshake who worship the sun. Well, nothing new under the sun, folks. That's all secret societies under, you know, one, one sentence. Now, these things have evolved and they've become counterfeits in the day and age because Satan has chosen again to give his power to the Catholic Church as the preferred vehicle to bring the mystery religion of the ages to its consummation. Do you get my point? Now, with Abraham Lincoln, what's important about Abraham Lincoln? I'm going to cover this in depth in a future episode on the history of the Jesuits and secret societies. Nevertheless, Abraham Lincoln hated the Jesuits. He knew that they were trying to kill him. He knew that they fomented the Civil War. The Jesuits assassinated Jefferson and Madison and many other presidents, especially early on in the history of the U.S., because they were trying to control the United States. The Jesuits fomented the Civil War in order to get the United States bankrupt, which led to the Act of 1871, where the Rothschilds, you'll see how they tie into this, basically took control of the government through the creation of the federal government, you know, loan, banking loans. This is their strategy from the very beginning. They didn't care who, which side was going to win. If, if the South won, great, you got slavery. If the North won, well, not as great, but still, you're bankrupt, so now we can own you. It didn't, it didn't matter. And the point is that if you realize that, you realize that ever since the Rothschilds were integrated by the Jesuits as their financiers, the method for controlling countries has been the same. Foment a revo uh, revolution, fund both sides of the conflict. Doesn't matter who wins because both of those people are in debt to you anyway. So this is how it works. Now, what do you have? Now you have a memorial to Lincoln. Put this together now. You have a memorial to Lincoln where he's sitting on a Roman throne, basically. What does that tell you? Well, it's telling you that it's a statement of boasting by the snake. Lincoln hated the Jesuits. They got him killed. They fomented the Civil War. And now there's a memorial to Lincoln that says, you're going to do what we tell you anyway. Lincoln was owned by the Roman power. Of course, I'm not saying he was a, a Jesuit operator. I'm saying he was owned as in he was taken care of by the Roman power. Now they've immortalized him in a submissive position on the, on the chair. And of course they tell you it's, oh gosh, it's Lincoln and he's sitting on his chair and, you know, justice and whatever other type of thing. But really what it tells to the, to the initiated, to those who understand, what they're really saying is you better do as we tell you. Otherwise you're going to end up like Lincoln. So those things are important to understand about the French Revolution, because the French Revolution was not just a bunch of upset people with rifles that were trying to get their rights back from the government, as the history books will tell you. The French Revolution had many occult and dubious things, many dubious associations. It's been painted as this beautiful thing with liberty and this romantic event for human history, but really it was everything the opposite of that. It was completely satanic, complete rebellion to God, completely driven by the Antichrist power of the earth. And it was a move towards darkness, communism, and ultimately the final phase of this system, which is the woman riding the beast. Remember that the woman riding the beast, the beast emerges from the bottomless pit during the time that the French Revolution happened. So if you understand the French Revolution and the art of war, then you practically understand the playbook for every other war and revolution that's happened after that and who's behind it, which is also very important. So now that takes me to my next section, which is the Jesuit origins of the French Revolution. Now let's talk about Adam Weishaupt, who is an important figure. Now that you are familiar with the art of war, let's read about Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt began his formal education at the age of seven at a Jesuit school. He later enrolled at the University of Ingolstadt and graduated in 1768 at the age of 20 with a doctorate in law in 1772. He became a professor of law after conversion to Protestantism. Now, if you believe he's a Protestant, 
I have some beachfront property in Phoenix that is going like hotcakes right now. You don't want to miss it. We have excellent, excellent beach and waves and pineapples and all kinds of great things, if you believe that this man was a Protestant. But if you know the art of war, he was a Protestant. Get the drift? After Pope Clement XIV's suppression of the sight of Jesus, Weishaupt became a professor of canon law, papal canon law, a position that was exclusively held by the Jesuits until that time. Isn't that something? A Protestant became a professor in a position that only the Jesuits had up until that time. Gosh, such an interesting thing. Foundation of the Illuminati. On May 1st, 1776, John Adam Weishaupt founded the Illuminati in the Electorate of Bavaria, and that's all you really need to know. So Weishaupt was a major figure in the next thing. Now, the next thing we want to read is, this is from a book called Daniel Understanding the Visions and the Dream. This is page 187. And we're going to read here. The text is extremely tiny, so... Pardon me while I squint. Adam Weishaupt was a Jesuit doctor of papal canon law at the Ingolstadt University of Bavaria. Weishaupt, you know what, I'm just going to zoom because this is very horrendous here. Weishaupt and his inner circle were not atheists. They believed in a God. However, this God is not Jesus Christ, but Lucifer. Communism is an anti-Christian atheistic force designed to destroy Christianity and all world governments by modern Day Luciferians. Of course, it's the opposite, and it's designed really, the, the other thing that this person should have written is that it's designed to destroy Christianity, biblical Christianity, so that you beg for religion in return, it's, that it makes religion look good. And of course, if you've studied any of the Dark to Light episodes I have, like where Pope John Paul goes to Poland, and they receive him with such joy, and they're literally begging for religion back. We want God back. Well, no, you want Catholicism back. And of course they do, because communism is designed to make the man of sin look appealing. But moving onward, let's see what it says here. Adam Weishaupt determined to wipe out Christianity, not just to counter it. His establishment of the Illuminati in May 1776 planned the French Revolution, planted the seeds for atheism and communism, and lay the foundation to prepare the world to receive the Pope as the world leader. He also led Jacobins, Jacobinism, and founded it in 1789. The design of his plan was to enlist many world bankers and leaders into his framework. As a result of, as a result, the French Revolution was set up as a kingdom based on atheism, including the concepts of humanism, which eventually evolved into the political system of communism, which again, remember, king of the north and king of the south. King of the south is this atheistic secular system that is now being exposed to you. The deep state, the globalists, the World Economic Forum. And king of the north is the guys that seem rational-minded, like Trump, with his red hat that is a symbol of your patriotism and Christian nationalism, and so on. That's the two dualities that you're seeing. And you're seeing it for a very important purpose, because the king of the south is going to be destroyed. But you have to understand where the king of the south originated. Moving on. The goddess, the godless kingdom of atheism in France looked independent, but was fully under the control of the papal system. Behind the scenes, the papacy pulled the strings. Today, many political and religious Leaders are now puppets under the under the masteries of the papal-controlled secret societies. And they tell you quite a bit about these things. And of course, there's so many Jacobins. The Jacobins in France during the French, during the late revolution, were a society of violent revolutionists who held secret meetings in which measures were concerted to, to direct the proceedings of the National Assembly. Hence, a Jacobin is the member of a club or other person who opposes government in secret and unlawful manner by the violent by violent means or any means possible or a turbulent demagogue. Of course, Jacobins were part of this whole thing as well. Jacobinism and so on and so forth. Let's see. On seven May 1st, 1776, Freemason Adam Weishaupt linked the Illuminati, which later also became communism. Next, his efforts established the 
French Revolution as a birth mother of communism. The Jesuits also used Karl Marx to write the Communist Manifesto in 1844, which codified the Illuminati's plans. The teachings of Marx were then passed down to Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky. Napoleon was also a high-degree Freemason, carrying out the plan of the Jesuits during the French Revolution. You'll see exactly how he was carrying out the plan. It's truly fascinating. During the time of the French Revolution, the years of communism, millions of Christians lost their lives through the murderous rages of these men who claimed that there was no God to worship except the goddess of reason. Remember that quote we read from the other book in the beginning? Papal supremacy, number one, was never able to control the Protestant Reformation. Once the Jesuits were formed, the papal plan to destroy Protestantism went underground, working through many secret societies. They planned the French Revolution and set up communism as a means of establishing a new world order, another way to establish universal dominion. The Iron Fist of Rome has always sought to be in control. Thank you very much, Motorcycle, for passing by in a neighborhood that is a quiet neighborhood, but not for you, apparently. When the Pope was taken captive in 1798 by Napoleon, it looked like the papacy had received a deadly wound. This well-devised smokescreen had deceived the world. Even though it appeared that the iron and clay would not mix, the iron was still in control, as noted in the image of Daniel 2. So, this is a very important piece of context, because again, it seemed like it suffered a mortal wound. It diffused people's... They, first off, they got back at the Pope for banning them and siding with the monarchs. Accomplished many things. They poisoned Pope Clement. Said, you know, made a statement about, hey, we're we're gonna do what we want to do. Remember, the the general does what he wants to do. If it's in alignment with the plan, then he does it, regardless of the sovereign's order. But he works with the sovereign too. And that was a statement that was made to the Pope. It was also a statement that was made to the outside world and to distract people and to think that, oh, this papacy is not, it's not a threat anymore. Now it's all about atheism and government. So everybody, all the Protestants these days who have been deceived by dispensationalism and Jewish-focused futurism and say, oh, the Pope is just some guy in a little white hat and he's just running around doing ecumenical stuff. They don't realize that all of that is a smokescreen that... When the mortal wound happened with the French Revolution, everything went underground and behind the scenes to bring the world back to the Mother Church. And of course, we are at the cusp of that situation. Very, very important. Now, let's see some stuff about the Jesuits and the French Revolution. Is there actual evidence the Jesuits really helped to instigate the French Revolution? Hmm. This is from Jeff, who is a writer. He's got some interesting quotes here that we can read. Now, we looked at the Declaration of uh, Rights of Man of Every Citizen, who's behind that, and what statements it's making. Who are the Jesuits? Let's see, John Adams. My history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written, but it is supported by unquestionable authorities and is very particular and very horrible. The Jesuit Order's restoration in 1814 by Pope Pius VII is indeed a step towards darkness, cruelty, despotism, and death. I do not like the appearance of the Jesuits. If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is the Society of Jesus, of Ignatius of De Loyola, really. That's what he said. John Adams, who was poisoned, by the way. Abraham Lincoln. The war, i.e. the American Civil War, would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. There's a lot of dialogues between Abraham Lincoln and a man named Chiniqui, Father Chiniqui, I believe, that are very interesting. Uh, Napoleon. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not a mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic sense, exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the world by the volition of a single man, i.e. the black pope, the superior general of the Jesuits. Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms, and at the same time, the greatest and most erroneous, enormous of abuses. There are great similarities between the Marxist revolution and the French revolution in relation to their Jesuit influence. Let's see. 
One, both revolutions were based on communist writings of Freemasons, Voltaire and Marx. Did not the Jesuits perfect communism and their reductions in Paraguay? There they are again. Of course, Voltaire was a Jesuit operative, and Marx and Engels, Engels was a Protestant. Do you understand? When you see these types of things, you should think art of war. Number two, both revolutions plundered the state churches. Both revolutions ended the monarchies. Were not the Jesuits enemies of both the Bourbon and the Romanov dynasties? Had not both monarchies expelled the Jesuits from their countries? Both revolutions produced Jesuit republics. Republics in form, but absolute monarchies in power. Both revolutions declared atheism as the religion of the state. Evidenced by their deeds are not the Jesuits truly atheists. They're the dark. They're the dark side of the light. The light to dark, you know, dualistic game. Both revolutions carried out a reign of terror by an inquis inquisitional secret police, which, by the way, repeats the inquisition that happened shortly after the Jesuits were formed. Both revolutions resulted in military dictators who punished the enemies of the Jesuits. Did not the Jesuits benefit in even though Napoleon and Stalin, in deceiving the nations, openly banned the order from France and Russia. Which, again, these are just like people say, oh, you know, what about the banning? Well, look, it's all just games. It's all just games, smokescreen to tell you, to make you get off of your guard. Remember the first thing that we read? All warfare is based on deception in the art of war. When we are close, make them feel that we're far away. When we're far away, make them feel that we're close. Just read the art of war and you understand all of this stuff is true. What are the Jesuit what are the Jesuits to gain from manipulating a revolution? Well, let's see. Internal conflict. The papacy and the Jesuits were not always on good terms with each other, mainly because of the trouble the Jesuits had taken with them in their sphere of influence, which is literally the whole earth, as well as their solemn and sinister vows. Many Catholics consider them fanatics. Eventually the Jesuits are suppressed by the papacy itself. Pope Clement XIV, he suppressed them, we know that. Papacy mortally wounded, Jesuits reestablished. So there's plenty of things. Now here's another quote by Giovanni Battista Nicolini, History of the Jesuits, Their Origin, Progress, and Doctrines, uh, 1854. During the order's suppression from 1773 to 1814, General Ricci created the Illuminati with his soldier Adam Weishaupt, the father of modern communism, who with his Jacobins, conducted the French Revolution. Years later, Jesuit General Ledochowski, with his Bolsheviks, conducted the, Rev the Russian Revolution in 1917, it being identical to the upheaval of 1789. And guess what? The current revolution, which is the revolution against the big bad deep state, the we the people, the nationalist revolution that's taking control of the world, that is being conducted also by the same people who conducted the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, and so on. Do you understand? Do you understand how these things work? Adam Weishaupt was a quote-unquote Protestant, but he was a Jesuit operative. He was a spy. Whether he was a converted spy or whatever, whatever kind of spy he was, doesn't matter. He was a spy. And Adam Weishaupt connected with other people like the Jacobins, with other secret societies, with the Rothschilds, as you'll soon see, and basically fomented this revolution. They were It's all networks of shadow and secret societies. Now, this is from, I love this quote, this is from theosophytrust.org, right? So this is a satanic Luciferian source. This is a very big paper that was written by Helena Blavatsky, grandmother of the New Age movement, famous 32nd or 33rd degree Freemason, Luciferian, author of Lucifer magazine, like as committed to the devil as you can get, okay? This is written by her. Now, very important thing here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see if we find it. Here it is. But when one studies history and the works of their own authors published with the imprimatur of the order, she's talking about the Jesuits, what does one find, she writes? that the Jesuits have practiced not only occultism, but black magic in its worst form, more than any other body of men, and that to it they owe in large measure their power and influence. 
Do you understand the weight of this statement? That somebody who is as committed to the devil as you can get is telling you that the Jesuit order has practiced more black magic than any other organization in the history of the world. And she's read quite a lot of history. And that that black magic is how they owe their success. Now, what does the Bible tell you? Revelation 13, verse 2, And the dragon gave the beast its power. And of course, in the Great Delusion in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says that this final delusion, which really is the world marveling after the beast and, and coming into this system, this delusion is by all power of Satan. Satan's power will be focused and organized to create this great delusion. Occult, black magic power. Testimony of another snake against another, one snake against another. Now, let's talk about the Rothschild connection. This is from a website called geopolitics.co. The Rothschilds are Jesuits. Another very, very important thing to know, which is the Rothschilds. These are all quoted from various books like Vatican Assassins, um, Rulers of Evil, uh, Tackling the Tough Topics, 2006. So there's all kinds of various links, but let's read a couple. If you're not an American, you will understand why your country is on its present course, as it too is controlled by the Jesuit general. Through its select Jesuits, Knights of Malta, Shriners, Freemasons, the Knights of Columbus, and the Illuminati's Masonic, Kabbalistic, Labor, Zionist, Sabbatian, Frankist, named after the Black Pope, Jewish House of Rothschild. For the order controlled the infamous House of Rothschild since no later than the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars, after which the Jesuit-led crusade the Rothschild family was surnamed the Guardians of the Vatican Treasury, which, let's really quick, take a quick break. This is from Jewish Encyclopedia under Rothschild. Let's see what it has to say, which you can look up for yourself. Yeah, let's see. Here we go. It is a somewhat curious sequel to attempt to set up a Catholic competitor to the Rothschilds that at present, the latter, i.e. the Rothschilds, are the guardians of the papal treasure. That's what you need to know about the Rothschilds. Moving on, the real power structure. The Treaty of Paris of 1763 designated King George III, arch treasurer and the prince elector of the Holy Roman Empire. And according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Rothschilds bear the guardians of the Vatican treasury, which we just confirmed. The Vatican treasury, of course, holds the imperial wealth of Rome. Imperial wealth grows in proportion to its victories in war. As the Jesuit empowerment regime militanis ecclesia implies, the church at war is more necessary than the church at peace. According to H. Russell Robinson's illustrated armor of imperial Rome, Caesarian soldiers protect themselves in battle with shields painted red. Do you understand? Since the soldiery is the state's most valuable resource, the Council of Trent admitted this in prefer preferring the Jesuits to all other religious orders. It is, it is easy to understand why the red shield was identified with the very life of the church. Hence the appropriateness of the name Rothschild, which in German is red shield. The appointment of the Rothschilds gave the Black Papacy absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the key to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? I believe this appointment explains why the House of Rothschild is famous for helping nations go to war. It is fascinating that as Meyer Rothschild's sons grew into the family business, the firm took on the title Meyer, Ar Meyer Amschel Rothschild und Son, which gives us the notorious MARS acronym. Isn't Mars the Roman god of war, whose heavenly manifestation is the red planet? There's a powerful Kabbalah here, which of course all these people are occultists, and there's hardly an acre of inhabitable earth that hasn't been affected by it in some way. This is uh, now Daryl Eberhardt. International finance and banking are not primarily Jewish. Many of the most powerful banking interests in the world are run by Gentiles, one of the most powerful forces in international banking is the Knights of Malta, a Roman Catholic military order controlled by the Jesuit Superior General. Sadly, even a certain segment of the alternative media helps to propagate the lie that the Jews run the international banking in the world, which is not true. Interestingly, one of the titles of the Rothschild banking dynasty is Guardians of the Vatican Treasury. There you go, a third witness that tells you the truth. 
The Jews, as a people, have been used for centuries as a scapegoat by the international banking, by the banksters and their secret societies, such as the Jesuit-controlled Knights of Malta. To label the Jews as running banking in Hollywood, etc., is to throw out the proverbial red herring, designed to throw us off the scent of the real controllers, which, again, proxies of proxies of proxies. Remember? When all of these spies are in in place, the five types of spies from the art of war, what does it tell you? It tells you that nobody can discover the secret system. And it's true, unless you have biblical discernment. That's why the Bible is so brilliant. The Bible tells you exactly where the head of the snake is and what to pay attention to. Because people loved, I've had so many comments, no, the Jews this, the Jews that, the Zionists, the Noahide laws, and you don't know about this, and you know about that. Look, there are many satanic vehicles on the, on the earth. But all of these are being run by who? Okay, you can't look at the fingers. You got to know where the palm is. Who's, who's the palm that is controlling all these fingers? And the Bible tells you, it is the beast. This is a famous picture everybody knows. This is Lord Rothschild. You can type in Lord Rothschild Satan. And uh, let's see if we can pull it up. This is a picture of Baron Rothschild with, uh, what's her name? Marina Abramovich, who's also a famous Satanist. And they have just this such a candid and heartwarming picture right in front of a painting that if you look into the painting, it's actually called Lucifer Summoning His Legions or Satan summoning his legions, which was written when, or painted when? 1796 to 1797. Do we know anything that was happening around that time? Maybe the French Revolution. Maybe does that have to do something with it? Maybe the beast that emerges from the bottomless pit? Do you see how all of this comes together, folks? It's all just so fascinating. So, conclusion. Rothschild in German means red shield which is a symbol of Roman power, really guarding the Roman treasury, which is the beast's money pot. The Jesuits are suppressed, so they use secret societies and infiltrators like Weishaupt and other people to form a shadow government that accomplish many things, that accomplish basically taking attention off of the beast. It accomplished you know, reigning in the Pope and, and showing him that you can't just go in line with what other people are saying. Because remember, the Pope went in line with the monarchs. And so the Jesuits are showing, you're, you're fine, you're going to see who has the power here, not the monarchs. And it also took attention off of the papacy because it seemed like it had a mortal wound. Oh, the papacy's gone, that's it. But all that happened is just a shadow government. Now that shadow government also allowed, by taking attention off the papacy and bringing in this communistic system, it created the precedent for duality and opposites. Communism versus nationalism, Christian nationalism. It also made the beast go away, seemingly, which allowed Protestantism to be infiltrated with dispensationalism to confirm, oh, you see, like, the Pope can't be the Antichrist because, look, he just got arrested by the you know, by the, whatever, by the Napoleon's general. He got arrested. He, Pope can't be the Antichrist. Come on. That was by design to also promote this false prophecy, which again, if you see my Great Delusion episode, we talk about it there quite a bit, how it ties into it. But all of these historical threads are very, very important. The Rothschilds became their financiers. Look, the Jews were nobody before the Rothschilds. They really weren't. You need to understand that the Jews and the Jewish system that you see today, Zionist, you know, web, is really a proxy for the snake. The Jews were literally nobody before the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds were propped up and were subsumed by the Jesuits as their red shield. And then, you know, they fomented various wars. They lent, you know, the Jesuits subverted them. The, the Rothschilds gave them money. And so through this, you know, dagger and seduction method, desire and fear, dark and light, they, they subsumed nations upon nations. They got the United States through the Civil War. They got other places through the two world wars that happened in Europe. They got China through communism. They got everybody. And every, anybody who didn't play along, like Libya, 
like all these people that didn't have central banks, well, we're going to take care of you because, you know, we have all the power now. Do you get the point? So slowly they took care, they could, took control of all these different countries through the Rothschilds, through banking, through all these things. They financed Hitler. They took America for the Pope through um, the Act of 1871. All of these things were designed to slowly bring the world back to the beast. These people work on incredibly long timetables. But the plan essentially started with the French Revolution. Weishaupt was a quote-unquote Protestant middleman that was between the Jesuits and the Rothschilds. They used a Gentile instead of a Jew because, again, on the outside, oh, it's a Protestant. But really, he's a secret society member. He's doing middleman work to coordinate these people, the Jacobins, the Rothschilds, all these things. He was the middleman. So that's something that you need to know about the French Revolution. Now, our final leg in all this will be with Napoleon. And this is Napoleon and the Jews. Very, very important. And I talk about this in my Great Delusion episode or series, specifically the episode on Zionism. But this is a fascinating bit of history. And we open, of course, with this little graphic Napoleon was the first leader in Europe to grant liberty, equality, and fraternity to all religions. In this lithograph of the period, Napoleon is granting liberty to the Jews. So here are the Jews, poor little Jews, and there, there's Napoleon, and he's granting them what? What is he granting them? Well, he's granting them a pyramid with light and an all-seeing eye and so on. So what is he actually granting them? He's granting them the false light, and you'll understand what I mean by that, because it's truly brilliantly evil. For religion, Napoleon ended the schism and restored the Catholic Church to France by the Concordat in 1801. He ensured freedom of religions and equality to Protestant sects. And he declared France the homeland of the Jews after it became obvious he could not establish their national home in Palestine. Do you understand? Oh, you will. You will after all this. It's just so fascinating. How did Napoleon's involvement with the Jews come about? Napoleon Bonaparte had not met any Jews in his youth, and perhaps not even during his school years in France. His first contact with the organized Jewish community probably took place on the 9th of February 1797 in Italy during the Italian campaign. When Napoleon and his army entered Ancona, the Jewish community was living in a small ghetto. Napoleon at the time remarked that certain people were walking around with yellow bonnets and yellow armband with the, quote, Star of David, which is the Star of Remphan, he asked one of his officers what the purpose of the yellow bonnet and armband were. The officer replied that these were Jews who had been identified in order that they returned to the ghetto every evening. Remember, the Jews were nobody, folks. They were scattered, dispersed countless times. They, they had nothing before the French Revolution. Napoleon immediately ordered that the armbands and the yellow bonnets be removed and replaced them with tricolor rosette. <laughs> Make them part of us, art of war. He closed the ghettos and gave instructions that the Jews could live wherever they wanted and they could practice their religion openly. The Jews of Ancona were overjoyed when they discovered that the first French soldiers who had entered the ghetto were Jewish. Later, Napoleon also closed the Jewish ghetto in Rome. He liberated also the Jews of Venice, Verona, and Padua. The liberator of Italy abolished the laws of the Inquisition, and the Jews felt free at last. Did he have a motive? Yes, he did. And yet, here is another interesting incident. On June 12, 1798, when the French occupied Malta, Napoleon learned that the Templar Knights did not allow the Jews to practice their religion in a synagogue, which, of course, if you know the Knights Templar and how they conquered the Jews in the Crusades and they just obliterated them and created half-Jew children, and those were ostracized. I mean, look, the Jews have been just pounced on and abused throughout history. So we should pray that they come to the gospel, of course. Most of them probably won't, but the point is that you need to understand the Jews are not the ones who control the world. Moving on. The knights enslaved their Jewish prisoners and mercilessly used them or sold them. He immediately gave permission to the Jews to, buy, to build a synagogue. What could be Napoleon's motive? Now here is an amazing incident which is not generally known. When the French troops were in Palestine and besieging the city of Acre, Napoleon had already prepared a proclamation making Palestine an independent Jewish state. There is the sentence of the day that you need to understand. 
He felt confident that he could occupy Acre, and the following days he would enter Jerusalem from, and from Jerusalem he would issue his proclamation. He was unable to realize this project because of the intervention of the British, which by that point in time were not subjugated to the machine yet. Remember, they were Freemasons, there were other groups, they weren't playing along fully. That's why you had World War I and II and all these other things that happened through secret societies of Rothschilds, which kind of grabbed everything and infiltrated their money system. Now you're going to play along. But when Napoleon wanted to create a state of Israel, the British were intervening and stopped it. This proclamation was printed and dated 1799, April, but his unsuccessful attempt to capture April 20th, by the way, which is Hitler's birthday, interesting, but his unsuccessful attempt to capture Acre prevented it from being issued. The Jews had to wait more than 150 years before their state was proclaimed. Oh yeah. The proclamation, however, did bear fruit. It was a precursor to Zionism, heightening awareness of the cause of Jewish statehood. The ideas of Napoleon Express found the admiration of many who saw Napoleon's gestures as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, which foretells of the restoration of the Jews to their land. It does not... No, it does not. That is the false prophecy. The idea drew many adherents, especially in England, where Darby met Irving and, um, what's his name, Schofield and all of them hung out, and Irving read Manuel Lacunza's book and translated it into English. He was so impressed, and then the rest is history. See how all this ties together? 118 years later, the British would issue their Balfour Declaration, which called for a Jewish homeland, and ultimately, 31 years later in 1948, Israel would be recognized as a sovereign state by popular vote in the United Nations General Assembly, which we look at in the Zionist episode. The vote for this was 33 to 13. And if you know that there's two sides of Freemasonry, Scottish Rite, York Rite, 33 stages, 13 stages, come on. Perhaps it can be said that Napoleon's premature announcement on that first day of Passover in 1799 played an important role in the creation of the state of Israel. Do you think? In the Paris Moniteur Universel on three prior yada yada, it was announced Bonaparte has published a proclamation in which he invites all the Jews of Asia and Africa to gather under his flag in order to reestablish the ancient Jerusalem. He has already given arms to a great number and their battalions threaten Aleppo, which is the Muslim caliphate at the time. On the 16th of August, 1800, Napoleon declared, if I govern a nation of Jews, I should reestablish the temple of Solomon. Do you understand? Napoleon was a Freemason, Jesuit operative. He was doing the Jesuits bid bidding. And what was, the, what was their goal with this? Gosh, it's so good. We have one more thing to read. I think this is a Matterschnick, whatever, Weinberg, who was the Austrian consul in Paris, in a letter to Count Stanon, Austria's foreign minister, stated, all Jews look upon Napoleon as their Messiah. He, are you starting to see the picture? Napoleon was the only government leader that gave Jews equality when most other nations kept them in bondage. He also abolished the special taxes on the Jews in Germany and gave, the, for the first time, civic and political equality. The best is yet to come, folks. Material golden age is coming. They've already practiced it. When strong opposition in France manifested itself, Napoleon stood firm in the support of Jewish equality. Of course, there's even a whole thing here. That he could reconvene the Sanhedrin, drew, he, and after he reconvened him, he drew a historical comparison between Napoleon and the ancient heroes, one of whom was Cyrus the Great. Cyrus, the king of Persia, was the initiator of Israel's first restoration. Well, that's not accurate because the restoration of Jerusalem was by the decree of Artaxerxes. Cyrus just decreed that the temple would be restored. Very important distinction. But they're comparing Napoleon to Cyrus. Keep that in mind. Messiah, the Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. Tsar Alexander of Russia protested violently against the liberation of the Jews and encouraged the Orthodox Church in Moscow to protest aggressively. He called Napoleon the Antichrist and the enemy of God because he liberated the Jews. Austria also protested. In Prussia, the Lutheran Church was extremely hostile towards Napoleon's decision and reaction in Italy was also not favorable, but not as aggressive. A most venomous attack on the Sanhedrin came from the Holy Synod of Moscow, which issued an open manifesto against the Sanhedrin. This proclamation dated December 1806 states, quote, 
In order to bring about a debasement of the church, Napoleon has convened to Paris the Jewish synagogue, restored the dignity of the rabbis, and founded a new Sanhedrin. So they were very much against it, especially the Orthodox, which, of course, they paid a very brutal price with the Bolshevik Revolution. Napoleon's uncle, Cardinal Fesch, also got involved. He told Napoleon, Sire, so you wish the end of the world to come with your laws to give the Jews equality like the Catholics? Do you not know that the Holy Scriptures predict that the end of the world will happen when the Jews will be recognized as a corporate nation? Which, of course, this is the false prophecy of the beast that this person was citing. In 1811, thanks to Napoleon's efforts, Portugal allowed the Jews complete freedom and permitted them to open their synagogues that were closed for 200 years. The Napoleonic period brought to the Jews of France, the Netherlands, Western Germany, and Italy the first intimations of modernity. It gave them the carrot to chase. It brought equality before the law and end to the oppressive taxation and enforced residential restrictions and the opportunity to participate as free men in public and political life. In those parts of Spain to which the French authority did not reach, the Inquisition continued to function. The sovereign of the post, the sovereigns of the post-Napoleonic era had a weakness in learning nothing and forgetting nothing. Now, this is, of course, a little bit more of a liberal article. So anyway, they're, they're kind of naive on some things, but they give you good history. After Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, the Holy Alliance was convened at the Congress of Vienna, which is another important meeting. At that time, the laws permit equality, liberty, and fraternity were retracted and were not applied again until 1830, when the principles fixed by the French Revolution and the First Empire were reinstated. So they had this dark-to-light thing going on where Napoleon revealed the light, the false light, the possibility, look, you guys could have your temple rebuilt, we could have a whole nation again. Of course, Napoleon lost... But then, you know, that created this desire, and then they, took, then they took away the laws to make them hungry, and then they gave them back the laws. Do you see the point? They oscillated the Jews to create a desire and a longing for this reality. And as you'll soon see, all of that led into the Zionist state of Israel. Prussia retracted the liberal laws in 1815 after the Battle of Waterloo. The first setback was inflicted upon the Jews of the Papal States. It would, be, it would almost seem as if Pius VII had taken revenge on the Jewish population of his territory for the humili humiliation he had suffered at the hand of Napoleon. He was not content with their confinement behind the walls of the re-elected ghetto, but he obliged the Jews to wear the yellow badge again. In Sardinia, the Jews were thrown back into the ghettos and not allowed to build synagogues. Much later, some European nations assimilated the Jews between 1824 and 1867. Notably in Holland, 1830, Sweden, 1834, and Sweden, 1838. It is remarkable that in England, it was only 1858 after Lord, L Lord Lionel Rothschild was elected five times, and that he was permitted to take a seat into the parliament. It is also interesting to know that the laws that were passed in France in 1808 are still in existence to this day. Bitter irony covers the historical fact that Napoleon's defeat stopped emancipation and plunged the Jewish youth into utter disillusionment and despair. The encounter of the Jewish people with Napoleon was a turning point of Jewish history. Yes, it was, folks. It was very much so. Up until Napoleon, they, had, they were just a scattered people. Napoleon gave them the false light that a Messiah figure could come and rescue them and give them a state of Israel and that we're nearing that messianic age, and look, the golden age is here, you can have religious freedom, and you can have this, and you can have that. That's what Napoleon did. For the first time, a modern sta statesman had envisaged the Jewish problem as a fundamental issue of international politics. For the first time in history, suddenly, people started caring about the Jews. For 1,700 years, the Jews were nothing. They were just a bunch of ragtag people kicked out of many European countries for several reasons that you can look into your own. But nonetheless, the Jews were nothing. Suddenly, the Jewish thing flipped with Napoleon. Why? Well, you're going to find out. Hopefully, you already know by now, but we, we will talk about it. Napoleon did more than any other leader prior to his time to give security and religious freedom to the Jews and nations under his control. He had little in the way of political motivation for his policy. That is not a true statement as there were no more than 40,000 Jews living in France at that time. Which, by the way, France at that time, what about 130 years before, you know, 
World War II. So do the math with Europe and how many Jews were supposedly living in Europe. Can you get to 6 million in 130 years? No, not by any stretch of the imagination because most populations grow, I think, what, like 2% or something like that? Over the course of a couple generations, you're not going to get to 6 million. So anyway, just a fun fact. Math is fun. Math is useful. This is prayer for the children of Israel. This is a prayer that the Jews wrote. Blessing Napoleon. I mean, I'm not going to read it, but basically it's blessing him. As of other kings of the world approach to fight, thou just protect him on the other day of war. Basically, they're they're lauding Napoleon up and giving a prayer that he's he's the Messiah figure, right? He's the Cyrus. He's the Messiah that finally cares about the Jewish people which is a fascinating bit of history to understand. So, let's put it all together. I cover this in my Great Delusion series, so you understand other threads that tie into this, but Napoleon was their first attempt to create a state of Israel and manipulate the Jews into adopting this false prophecy that they created as a part of the Counter-Reformation. Remember, the Jesuits are the ones who created dispensationalism. You can see a direct link in my series, The Great Delusion. The Jesuits are the ones who created this, and so, of course, they needed the Jews. Do you get it? The Catholic Church hated the Jews. They could care less about the Jews. But suddenly, once Manuel Lacunza and Ribera and and Bellarmine all wrote their theses and their commentaries on Revelation as a way to defend against the Protestants who were exposing the beast system, that now, oh no, it's actually a physical temple, not a spiritual temple, that, you know, it's going to be a guy that walks into that. Well, now, oh man, now we need the Jews, dang it. Now we need the Jews, so what do we do? Well, now let's flip from dark to light. Instead of treating them with darkness, let's treat them with false light. Promise them the world, promise them, you know, equal treatment. They have their own material salvation. Of course, the Jews are all about signs and wonders and fleshly, carnal, material salvation. That is part of Judaism. And so they played to their fantasies. And they propped up Napoleon as a messianic figure that was suddenly all about the Jews, gave them, he was liberating them, he was the liberator, and he was even going to create a state of Israel. But he failed. He failed because the world hadn't yet fallen completely under the hand of the beast. It was a premature grab. But nonetheless, they used it They used it because it allowed the enticement of the Jews with this idea that, oh, this is a possibility now. Then, of course, the years after that, for the next couple decades, some countries reinstated the laws, some took them away, the Jews were persecuted again. So it just, it created this thing of like, hey, like, let's go back to that. And of course, by the 1850s, 50 years later, you had people like Moses Hess, who is the grandfather of Zionism who influenced Theodore Herzl, who went to the Pope and prod- who promised a, a Catholic conversion of the Jews if he would just help him. And of course, after that, you had two world wars in the state of Israel. So people who think that the state of Israel is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, you are just heavily deceived. Moses Hess, by the way, was also in cahoots with Marx and Engels. They all were three peas in a pod. In fact, Moses Hess was called the communist rabbi, which is an interesting thing I look at in another one of my Zionist videos, but what's the point? Well, the British, at the time that Napoleon failed, he failed because the British weren't, it was secret society orders. There were different orders of Freemasons. And he failed because they interfered with him. So everybody's fighting for turf. 15 years after the Jesuits were reinstated, so the Jesuits were reinstated in 1814, 15 years later, around the 1830s, you began to see Protestant infiltrations in England with questioning the historicist perspective of Bible prophecy. For example, the Plymouth Brethren with Darby, Irving, Maitland, all these other things, which I uh, talk about in my series, The Great Delusion. But, you know, the rest is history, how dispensationalism took over. And while dispensationalism was taking over the Protestant world, Politically speaking, you had this emergence of Zionism, which was parallel to dispensationalism running, and so they're kind of confirming one another, so to speak. Do you see the point? They were running both of these threads at the same time. Zionism began with Napoleon. That's the mind-blowing 
discovery of today. Zionism began with Napoleon. Zionism was needed because, of again, they had this false prophecy that they had to fulfill. And what better way than to get the Jews to actually go along with this and create a false state of Israel and to convince all the Protestants who are taking up this poison that, look, it's Bible prophecy coming to be. So the state of Israel is a false prophecy, but it was much, it was orchestrated much earlier than people realize. Napoleon was a, was their first attempt to rally the Jews around a charismatic salvation, uh, savior type of figure. Napoleon failed, but Napoleon set the precedent. Then you had Hitler, and we look at that in the series, who was also propped up. He, Hitler was part Rothschild, and he was propped up by the papal power to oppose the dark, light versus dark. Hitler transferred all the, you know, like 60,000 Jews to Israel or to Palestine, really. And, of course, by then, England was playing along because they had been infiltrated by the Rothschilds and the secret society. And so they signed the Balfour Agreement with Lord Rothschild, which funded the state of Israel. And voila, now you have the next iteration, or really the final iteration, which is Trump. Do you see the point? Trump is what? People are calling him King Messiah Trump. I've documented this in my Trump expose in the Zionism section. He has a coin literally with his face and Cyrus minted on it. Remember how they were comparing Napoleon to Cyrus? It's the same thing, folks. They're running the same thing on the Jews. And that was the missing link, which is how how does Trump fall into this? With Because he's, he's, from the outside, if you don't understand how these things tie together, he has his hand in both pots. He's in the Christian nationalist crowd with all the crazy NAR people, but he's also with the Jews and the, and the Zionists. So it's like, what's going on here? Well, when you understand that all of this is really moving towards one great delusion where the Jews will be converted, then you understand how that works. But they need a charismatic figure who is going to rally the Jews and play to their fleshly desires for a Messiah and make them get this impetus to build the temple because they're so hungry for a fleshly salvation because they deny the truth. What does Second Thessalonians 2 tell you? God sends them great delusion because they had not a love for the truth. They denied it. Because they deny the truth, they're going to be deceived by a great deception. And of course, you won't because you're here and you're learning these things. And hopefully the people around you will learn too. But Trump is the final iteration of this Napoleon, Hitler, charismatic, you know, Messiah figure that will rally the Jews. Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He's all about the Jews, but he's doing it to, to rally them around and get this temple built so that the great delusion can come to pass. And I talk about what that is in my series. It'll be a supernatural event of some kind that will lead to some sort of charismatic revival in Israel. And people will think, you know, we're, we're all here now. It's the golden age, which again, what did Napoleon do? He was showing them the light, showing them the false light golden age. The best is yet to come, folks. Literally the same way Trump is behaving, that was Napoleon. The best is yet to come. Hitler was a false light leader. He was promising all these things. The Third Reich was going to be this golden, you know, empire, kind of like a Christian nationalist, but really it's kind of an occult golden nationalist, whatever empire, but same stuff. There's nothing new under the sun. Napoleon set the stage by get, by dangling the carrot of a national identity to the Jews. It's something that they never had. It was preposterous. Nobody in their right mind would have thought that the Jews would need to come to their homeland. Never. Not for 1,700 years. Suddenly that changed. Well, if you understand the context, then you realize why that changed and why this is just such a deception. The Jews were vagabonds. They never expected to return to the Middle East. But Napoleon lit that fire, even so much to say that he would build the temple again. Why? Because his Jesuit masters told him that that's what he needs to do. Conquer Jerusalem for the Pope, build the temple again so we can usher in this false prophecy. But they failed. They did. They, that was, you know, round one. And of course, they weren't as organized as they probably could have been. But that's just, they, they do these things in sequences, Remember, communism was practiced for 150 years before communism. 
Hollywood was practiced for 200 years or whatever in, in Europe with all the theaters. All these things are practiced. What you're seeing now with Trump and Zionism and all this stuff has been practiced twice. Napoleon and then Hitler. The beast always manipulated the Jews for their outcomes. See my Great Delusion series so you understand the full extent of that because the Jews will be used for the final deception in a way that a lot of people don't expect, and that has to do with the mark of the beast. But nonetheless, final thoughts. The French Revolution is a key inflection point in history that you need to be aware of. And it's also very important with Bible prophecy. It ended the 1260-year period of rule by the beast, which was very obvious and in your face, and it began the, simultaneously it began the beast's resurrection back into glory through several things, abolishing monarchies in favor of the two-party dialectical system, creating communism as an opposition to Christian nationalism, the left versus right dialectic, which is now coming to a head. It created the impetus for Zionism through Napoleon. It unified secret societies and international banking under the beast. It created many false ideologies and false narratives that poison Christianity, like dispensationalism, humanism, libertarian free will. All these things are part of the great delusion. Christian nationalism rests on human, on libertarian free will. These people believe that we need to do something for Christ to return, which is completely antichrist. God has determined events. You are participating and experiencing those events, but he has predetermined them. That's why you have Bible prophecy. If you could rush the clock, then there'd be no point for Bible prophecy. Do you see the point? It's antichrist. But that's what these people believe, and they believe that because they have been poisoned with French Revolution libertarian free will values. Humanism, Enlightenment era kind of stuff. Just poison. And of course, false eschatology. So when you mix those two things together, what do you get? You get the great delusion is what you get. Today, we're at the culmination of these events. Things like the deep state versus the white hats. Of course, you know who wears a white hat. Russia, like the Orthodox nationalists there versus the communist Nazi Ukraine, which by the way, Nazis were, everybody calls themselves, it calls each other Nazis, but Nazis were like nationalists. And they were, anyway, but versus the communist Ukraine people. You have the MAGA red hats, which of course is like the Jacobin red hats. It's all the same thing, folks. They've run these revolutions over and over again. This is just in the other direction. Do you get the point? It's the same thing. It's just pointed in the other direction. And if you understand that there's only two directions that these things can go, then you understand who's behind these things. The MAGA red hat is really just like a Jacobin red hat. Of course, you know what MAGA stands for. MAGA is not Make America Great Again. That's the exoteric. The esoteric, meaning those who are initiated. MAGA is the highest rank in the Church of Satan as a female. There's Magus and MAGA. MAGA is the female. Now, why is that important with the French Revolution? Do you remember the goddess of reason? How, of course, they have to invert everything. Where God tells you he's the father you now have the goddess, the Mother Earth, the, the female divinity that's coming, Mother Mary, all this female stuff. And of course, with the French Revolution, it was all about the divine feminine, the goddess. Well, what is Maga? Maga is the highest ranking feminine in the, Satan, in the Church of Satan with a red hat like a Jacobin hat. I mean, come on. It's just, you got to see through these things, folks. I really hope people will watch my Trump series. I hope they'll watch The Great Delusion People need to wake up. This this great delusion is going to deceive a lot of people. You know, you you as a conservative, we laugh at the liberals that they were deceived by the jib jab, by their woke leaders. Of course, they were deceived by the woke attitudes of the left. But guess what? Deception goes both ways. It's not just for the left. The right is going to deceive the right very soon. It's already been happening. And people are going to be even more deceived. You thought the left was deceived? Just wait till the Great Delusion. But things are repeating. They're just repeating just like World War II, except they're going in the opposite direction. From dark to light. World War II, the dark side won. Remember, Hitler was a Rothschild. He was propped by the Jesuits. So were the communist Bolsheviks. Hitler lost. So communism dominated the paradigm for 80 years. 
communism and liberalism and socialism and this left wokest stuff dominated the world. But that's by design because that was designed to push people really hard to the left so that they could swing back to the right and swing hard into Christian nationalism, which is what's happening now. All the threads are integrating charismatic movement, Zionism, Christian nationalism, false end times views. It's all coming to a head, folks. And it's truly, like I said, I marvel when I look at all this. It's profound how it's being orchestrated, which is proof to you that this is a satanic power. There's no way regular people could just like plan this out. No freaking way. These people are being guided by the devil. Absolutely. Because the devil gave the beast its power. Bible tells you. So the image of the beast is about to be completed. The beast will be resurrected and it will begin to enforce its mark. Very important that you understand that we are very close to that. The impetus of the French Revolution is now coming to a head. And if you understand everything that I've reported to you in this particular episode, video, podcast, you understand where this is going and you understand that we don't have too much time left. Watch my end time series, watch my Christian nationalist playlist, watch my Great Delusion series. You have to understand how all these things tie together, folks, because it's happening very soon. And you watch my Sabbath series. Learn the truth about the Sabbath. Learn the truth. Do not be deceived. Don't be stubborn. Just entertain the evidence for crying out loud. I don't base anything on just willy-nilly ideas. I do the research and I base my beliefs on evidence, as should you. Watch my Sabbath series because that will be center to what is coming very shortly with the mark of the beast and the image of the beast being completed. Remember one thing also, no matter what happens, the Lord is coming to save us from all this. The worse it gets, the more hope we have. And it proves that God is sovereign. He told you about these things ahead of time. He told you about it with Daniel, Daniel 2. Thousands of years of history. He told you about it through John, through the papacy, through the image of the beast, the mortal wound. He told you about all of these things and they've come to pass, which proves that he's sovereign over evil. All of this is going to be meaningless one day. It really will be. And you have to keep that picture of eternity when this will just be like a fog, if at all. Imagine living for thousands of years. You won't even remember any of this stuff. You really won't. So what matters right now is clinging to the Lord and sharing the truth with others. 